Hi, I'm Peter J. Ray. Welcome to my second floor lair. How do you like my shirt? This is a shirt that was made from a painting of my mother, Ruth Smallshaw Ray. It's a painting of a turbot, which is a very uh, nice fish in the, found in the Bahamas, where we went on many vacations. Uh, my father, my mother was a fine watercolor artist. My older sister, Pamela, died when she was 16. It was very hard on my parents, extremely hard, just imagine losing a daughter. And uh, so anyway, they, uh, um, uh, but, but they became better people, my, my parents. You know, they, they started looking for people they could help because they, you know, they understood. They had an understanding of, of suffering because of what, how much they suffered. And then my mom had a good friend, Char, Mc, Char McQuilkin Robertson, who Every, every April, was my sister died in April 11th, every April my mother would feel pretty bad, and so her, her friend Char organized uh, art shows for my mother at the Barton Center at Lakewood. And I was very happy for my mother. My dad and I would haul the paintings there from our home, and my mom did very well. She sold a lot of paintings, and they're all over here in the Cleveland area. Did real well. Fine painter. Good people, my, my mother and father. Uh, today's topic is... Restless Remarkable Books, number 20. The first book today is Time Peace by Richard Paul Evans, published in 1996. This, of course, the, the author, his most famous book is The Christmas Box. And he did, did very well, and uh, he's written quite a few books now. He's a Mormon. He's a very good fellow. He writes these short books that promote prayer, the power of prayer, and uh, very often deal with the death of children and what happens when, you know, what, what that's like and how hard it is and how, how prayer really helps people to uh, the parents who've lost a child. And, uh, and th this book in particular uh, is set in 1913, and it has a married couple whose, whose little girl died. And uh, so it's, it's very touching. In fact, they, they, put up a, uh, they put up all over the U.S. these... Uh, Angel statues of angels, to uh, which, because he's he's helped many people who've lost young children, whose whose young boy or girl have died, and uh, the books are you actually you can read his books each one probably in a day, if you put your mind to it. They're not too long. It's very very nice, very very uplifting, very positive, very helpful. He's a, had a very positive effect on the world. In fact, he's used a lot of his money, done very well to uh, build a shelter for children who. Who are in trouble. The next book is A Patchwork Planet by Ann Tyler, published in 1998. Ann Tyler is an amazing author, writing about contemporary life in the United States and uh, family life in particular. This, uh, in this book, the main character is Barnaby Geatland, who is a black sheep. And uh, that, uh, that appealed to me because I've been a, was a black sheep in my family. Really gave my parents a hard time and Gave them a lot of grief, especially, you know, they'd already lost a daughter. Then they had a lot of trouble with me. So, anyway, Ann Tyler's a wonderful writer. I highly recommend her books. <coughs> the next book is On Being Brown by Scott Hewler, published in 1999. See, the Cleveland Browns um, moved to Baltimore after the 1995 season. It became the Baltimore Ravens, and then we got a new Browns team in 1999. We didn't have a team in 1996, 97, 98. So there was a lot of nostalgia. There were a lot of Brown's books written during that time. This is a very, very fine book. Uh, he talks about, uh, has wonderful vignettes about guy, guys who played for the Browns, like Lou Groza, they called the toe, who was a field goal kicker. I believe he, he had a field goal that won a championship. Uh, and Jim Brown, great running back, Paul Brown, who for whom really the Browns are named, Mike Phipps, who was the <coughs> quarterback, 1972, when my first season following the Browns. We actually had a, believe it or not, we had a wide receiver that year named Fair Hooker, and uh, the Browns in 72 gave the, the Dolphins, who won the Super Bowl and were undefeated, they gave them a, a good game in the playoffs. Paul Warfield, who was the great uh, wide, wide receiver, uh, Greg Pruitt was the great running back in the 1970s. Little guy, did real well. And they, it's nice hearing him on the radio. They, they, he says, uh, this is Greg Pruitt, your favorite former Browns running back for 92.3 The Fan, this radio station. Uh, Brian Sipe, 
who was for 1980 hero, actually MVP that year, Bernie Kosar, who you know can do no wrong in Cleveland for what he did for the Browns in the late 80s and into the 90s. Ozzie Newsome was a great a tight end, I believe he's, yeah, and he's been an, a tremendous uh, general manager for the Baltimore Ravens. Otto Graham, who was this quarterback, won seven, seven of the eight titles. Ernest Biner, of course, who had the fumble. So touching when they made this movie, uh, Believeland, when he apologized. You feel so sad, this, this poor guy. And uh, you know, he, he, he had fumbled in the 1987 AFC Championship game near the end. But he had a tremendous game. Uh, Jerry Shirk and so forth. Actually, um, there's, I think, an afterword or a foreword written by Martin Mull, the actor and comedian who was from Cleveland. And he wrote about an experience at a Browns game at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium when there was a, a goal line stand by the Browns. And I think he was at, you know in the bleachers, which they, they called the dog pound. And, and the Browns held. You know, they, the other team needed a touchdown late in the game, and they, they, they didn't score. And so that, he talked about how, what, what an experience that was. <coughs> The next book is Our Tribe by Terry Pluto, published in 1999. This is a wonderful book. It's about the Cleveland Indians and about fathers and sons. You know, his his father was a Cleveland Indians fan, and and he and his father. And this you know reminded me of my father and me. We were we went to so many games back at the old Cleveland Municipal Stadium back in the 1970s. We'd enter at Gate A, and uh, usually uh, I think it was over by Boudreaux Boulevard. And uh, we go and get our tickets, usually upper upper reserve between home and first. They're like three dollars and fifty cents. And we get a couple hot dogs and a couple cokes during the game. My dad would we get to order peanuts, and my dad would have a cigar. And it was you know, wonderful. Those, those teams back in the nineteen seventies. I remember when we entered Gate A one year. They were playing the song "Happy Days Are Here Again." Happy days are here again. The skies above are clear again. Wonderful song was actually Franklin D. Roosevelt's campaign song in the 1932 U.S. presidential election. So this is a very touching book because, you know, a big part of being a sports fan is fathers and sons. You know, and now my son, Tim, we watch games, you know, the different Cleveland teams, the Indians, Browns, and Cavs. So this is a very, very touching book. The next book is... The Best of Cleveland Brown Memories by Russell Schneider, published in 1999. Sorry about the telephone. (coughs) Doesn't seem to be anything I can do about it. Uh, It's one of these technical difficulties. So um, please be patient with with, with me. And, and, oh, God, got to listen to this. Good grief. Okay. So, all right. Um, anyway, this book, Russell Schneider was a tremendous uh, 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 writer for the Cleveland Plain Dealer. He wrote about in the sports section, Indians, Browns, and so forth. Then he wrote this book and talking about the uh, championship teams of the Browns, 1946, 1947, 48, 49, 50, 54, 55, and 64. Of course, they also had the Cleveland Rams who won in 45. From Otto Graham to Brian Sipe to to Bernie Kosar, to Tim Couch. So, yeah, Russell Schneider is a very beloved uh, for me because part of my childhood, reading his uh, articles in the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealer Sports section. The next book is Legends by the Lake, The Cleveland Browns at Municipal Stadium by John Keim, published in 1995. Yeah, another great book about the Browns. You see, they really were coming out with these books. Uh, at this time, I had the Cleveland City of Champions T-shirts that I was promoting and uh, people were getting geared up for the return of the Cleveland Browns in 1999 of course here it is you know 18 years later and they, this year right, we haven't won a game but hope springs eternal for the sports fan and we have, every time I pass by First Energy Stadium and see those orange seats I feel happy and it's really you know they're called the Cleveland Browns but actually orange is the operative word those are the orange helmets which is really for me you know the sense of uh, attraction and loyalty too and the players. The next book is A Man in Full by Tom Wolfe, published in 1998. This is a tremendous novel about set in Atlanta, Georgia, United States in the 1990s. <coughs> Has these amazing characters. Charlie Croker, who had been who was a had been a great football player, became a businessman, Buck McNutter, Farik the Cannon Fannin, and uh, 
this one, the thing that I remember very clearly from the book is there was a character. He was just a, he was a young fella and uh, maybe 25, married, had a young child, and he was working in a warehouse. His hands became very, very big and very fingers became very thick from all this work he did moving boxes. Then he got laid off. And he went to try, he tried to get a job, he knew how to type, he tried to get a job as, uh, that involved typing, but he couldn't, he couldn't make it because his fingers had gotten so big, so he kept making all these mistakes. And then he ended up, uh, his car got towed, he parked in, when he went for this interview, his car got towed, he tried to get the car out, uh, well, he went, he didn't have the money to, to get, take the car home, you know, and you really need a car to, to survive in life, and, uh, Anyway, he jumped over the fence to try to steal his car, and he, had, he got arrested. He went to prison for a couple of years, this poor fellow. And then you really feel for him. You know, he's got a wife and a young child. And then in prison, he had ordered a book. It was, I think, a, like a cowboy book, Western book. And instead, he got an ancient book from uh, ancient Greeks, I believe, Epictetus. And he's like, oh, man, good grief. I hear I'm in prison. I get this. I didn't get the book I wanted, but he read the book, and it helped him a lot because it was it was full of ancient Greek religion. And you know, the ancient Greeks for them, Zeus really was God, and there was all this wisdom and spirituality, and this helped him a lot and helped him and changed his life dramatically. So going to prison really helped him, and I, I thought, wow, this is really something. You know, it just shows that. <coughs> This is a this is a very terrible situation he was in, but he, uh, good came out of it because he discovered you know he didn't have much he had all this time on his hands and he read Epictetus, the an ancient Greek who helped a guy in the 20th century uh, through because of this spirituality and wisdom. The next book is Tuesdays with Maury by Mitch Album, published in 1997. This is a wonderful book, very very touching. I believe uh, Maury was a was uh, an uncle, someone the author knew who had who was very sick, who was dying. I believe he had Lou Gehrig's disease, and then the author would visit him. And uh, you know, when you're dying, you see things differently. I'm sure. And this this so he this was as this fellow was dying, he was trying to impart some some wisdom, some thoughts about life. And the one thing he said is. The one thing he says, love each other or die. You know, we have to love each other. It's such a simple thing. This is the, you know, the two commandments that Jesus stressed, most important, that we love, we should need to love God and love each other. And, you know, we don't do it. We don't do it. Or some people, not in, some people do it, but not enough. And we all need to do it. And we all can do it. It's all very, it's very simple. You know, we can do that. And if we do, we'll find our lives become wonderful. You know, we can stop, you know, we can really care about each other and stop, you know, because people tend to be critical and angry and so forth and, and really abusive and mean even and cruel. And this is, this is terrible. And this is why life is horrible when, when this happens. But if we can love God, love each other, how wonderful this world would be. All the problems in the world would disappear. And, and we can do it. This is not something that's impossible. We can, and so it's, anyway, we'll just, you can just, you just do it yourself. And just start, it all comes down to an individual basis and, and, and and we make our you can make your contribution by uh, by loving God and loving each other, but yourself and being a good example, and others will will follow. Because there's been too much hypocrisy in the world. People saying one thing and doing another. The next book is Sports in Cleveland, by John Grabowski, published in 1992. Now the thing in this book that I got was an amazing piece of information how Cleveland won three professional sports championships in the 1920s, uh, the Cleveland <coughs> Rosenblum's basketball team. Won uh, in the, Amer- in the uh, ABL, American Basketball League, in 1926, 1929, and 1930. Cleveland, in fact, Cleveland had the first dynasty in professional basketball. These three teams, wow, incredible. And I've been writing to Dan Gilbert of the of the Cavaliers that they should have three banners hanging from the ceiling at Quick as Alone Arena honoring the Cleveland Rosenblums, American Basketball League champions in 1926, 1920, 1930. He also talks about uh, Jesse Owens, of course, who won four gold medals in the 1936 Berlin Olympics. In 1915, Cleveland won an amateur baseball n- national title. 
Anyway, I haven't heard back from uh, Dan Gilbert. I think I've written a couple times, but that's that's the story of my life. The uh, involved in uh, projects like this, which uh, uh, yeah, I don't know if you they're not they're sort of quixotic, like Don Quixote. But I, you know, it's it's worth trying. You never know if you if you try to do something. I'd, I'd read one book where a guy wrote a letter to Richard Nixon and encouraging him to run in 1968. Nixon had lost in 1960. He, was kind of, he thought his career was over in politics. But, you know, that, that letter had an impact on him. It kind of inspired me because to keep on my letter writings and these one some would consider hopeless quests. The next book is Trump, The Art of the Deal by Donald J. Trump and Tony Schwartz, published in 1987. Yeah, this is years ago when Donald Trump was, uh, before he got into politics, here he is, now he's the U.S. president. And I read this part, book partly because uh, Trump was the owner of the New Jersey Generals in the United States Football League, and he signed Brian Seip from the Browns. We lost Brian Seip, who signed with uh, Trump's team, the Generals, in the USFL. And so I was kind of interested in that. And uh, so... Uh, yeah, the, you know, so this is about Donald Donald Trump's life in business, and um, uh, and I, I thought, you know, when Hillary Clinton was campaigning in Cleveland against Trump, trying to win the nom- the, the election in November of t- last year, she should have brought that up. You know, how can you folks vote for Donald Trump? He signed Brian Seip uh, from the Browns, took away Brian Seip, who was this uh, tremendous player in Cleveland. The next book is. When the Grass Was Real, Unitas, Brown, Lombardi, Sayers, Butkus, Namath, and all the rest. The 10 Best Years of Pro Football. This is about uh, professional football in the United States in the 1960s. There were two leagues back then, the AFL and the NFL. I think the AFL started in 62. Anyway, they were rival leagues, and uh, this helped get player salaries up. And eventually, the, you know, the Super Bowl started. You had the AFL championship champions and the NFL champions, and they started playing each other. And then they merged <coughs> in, uh, I think, in 67. Yeah, the two leagues merged. The AFL became the AFC. The NFL became the NFC. And then you had, uh, and they were both in the NFL. So the AFL came to an end. So he's talking about these, you know, uh, star players, Johnny Unitas for the Baltimore Colts, Jim Brown for the Browns, uh, Vince Lombardi for the green, coach of the Green Bay Packers, <coughs> Gail Sayers for the Chicago Bears, Dick Butkus, a tremendous linebacker for the Bears, Joe Namath, you know, who's such a cool fella, who won the su- Super Bowl for the New York Jets, this cool uh, quarterback here, first guy in the NFL to wear white shoes while playing NFL football, and of course the 1964 Cleveland Browns who were NFL champions. The next book is The Cleveland Local by Les Roberts, published in 1997. Oh, this was a, this is a wonderful book. I, uh, this, is the, this is one of about 20 or more than 20 novels by Les Roberts with this character, Mylon Yakovich, who is a, uh, it's fiction. This was uh, sent to me by my <coughs> friend in Guam, Dan Fanton. Anyway, the books are set in Cleveland, and Mylon Yakovich is a Slovenian-American private investigator. He'd been in the Vietnam War, and he'd been in the Cleveland Police Department, and then uh, during these books, he's you know, a private investigator, uh, investigating uh, uh, and usually involving a murder mystery. And the thing that appealed to me, I was in the Philippines, I missed the Cleveland area, and so I love these books. I've read, I've read most of them. I think I've read maybe 15. They're very short. They're about 20, 200 pages. Pretty easy to read, and, and the character's very endearing. He's a good fellow, this Mylon Yakovich. And what I liked is when he would be investigating during the course of his work, often he'd go into a bar and you have a beer, and he'd, there'd, maybe there'd be a game on, an Indians, Browns, or Cavs game, and he'd ask you know, about the score, and he'd watch for a while, and they'd tell him, like, oh, well, well uh, Albert Bell just hit a home run, or Bernie Kosar just threw a touchdown pass, or... You know, Mike, Mark Price just hit a shot for the Cavs. So I love these books. They're wonderful. Hopefully, uh, I have communicated with the author on Facebook. Hopefully, they'll make movies on it. I think they'd be, these would be wonderful movies. The next book is The Dream Palace of the Arabs by Fuad Ajami, published in 1998. 
This is a book about the Middle East back then when it came out, and which is a very confusing region. And so many different things going on. You have different dictators and then religious issues between uh, you have uh, Muslims, Christians, and Jew, Jewish people. The Arab-Israeli conflict, which is really a, still, still an ongoing thing. And back then, the Saddam Hussein dictatorship of Iraq, the Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, who had started, which he'd taken power in, uh, I think, in uh, 79. Uh, Nasser, who was a dictator of Egypt. Anwar Sadat, also a leader of Egypt. Hosni Mubarak, uh, again in Egypt. Yasser Arafat, who was the Palestinian leader. So this is an interesting, very important topic for the Middle East, all these different countries, and uh, very, very interesting and important. The next book is Talking Straight by Lee Iacocca, published in 1988. Lee Iacocca was the fellow who took over or was appointed the head of Chrysler Automobile Company when Chrysler was in big trouble. You know, years ago, the, uh, the Japanese, American cars really were dominant all, all over the world back in the late 40s, 50s, 60s, into the 70s. And then the Japanese became very successful uh, the Japanese companies, Toyota, Honda, and so forth. And uh, and American car companies were in trouble. And so Ayakoka did a good job. He came in and really helped turn Chrysler around. Otherwise, they, they would have gone out of business. So he's a good fellow. Uh, he has a very positive spirit, you know, very, uh, very good man and very strong-willed and uh, very patriotic. He was involved in the, uh, I think, the, the restoration of the Statue of Liberty. And so Lee I- Ayakoka, he... Talked about running for president, but but he did not. So, good fellow. The next book is The Testament by John Grisham, published in 1999. I think this is the only John Grisham novel that I read. It's uh, He writes these uh, legal novels. The characters are lawyers. And, uh, yeah, so it's, there's a lot of adventure in this book. In, in Brazil's wetlands, I found that I found there was spirituality. And, uh, yeah, uh, Grisham has written many, many books, and they're all these legal uh, novels, deals with uh, lawyers, fictional stories, very entertaining. And uh, my friend Bob Kinsey was big on Grisham. And you'll see him in the, in the in, if you look in the bookstore, in the book, sh- you'll see them around. John Grisham. I, I kind of wish I had uh, read more and, and promoted them with my father because he was a lawyer. I wonder if he would have liked them. I don't think he ever read a John Grisham novel. The next, the next book is Man of the House, The Life and Political Memoirs of Speaker Tip O'Neill by Tip O'Neill and William Novak, published in 1987. <coughs> this is a wonderful book. Tip O'Neill, as, as I said, he was the Speaker of the House, which means the leader of the House of Representatives, which is the, one of the two branches in Congress. You have the House and the Senate, and the House is based on representation. So he was an important person in American politics and, and for a very long time. You know, he worked with John F. Kennedy, Lyndon Johnson, Richard Nixon, Gerald Ford, Jimmy Carter, and Ronald Reagan. He was a, an old-fashioned liberal and a good fellow. Uh, there's a nice quote here by Sam Rayburn, quote, There's no limit to what can, you can accomplish if you're willing to let someone else get the credit. Now, that's a very profound statement. You know, we just imagine if you can, if you can do that and, the whole point of life is to accomplish things. But, but you know, we often want credit. And uh, so let other people take the credit. And you just, uh, the main thing, you'll know and, and uh, God knows. And, and eventually the truth comes out, or maybe it doesn't. But, but uh, you have the satisfaction of knowing that you, that you accomplished something. You made a contribution to this world. The next book is Civilization and its discontents by Sigmund Freud and Notes from the Underground by Fyodor Dostoevsky. This is another great book's volume. And, of course, Sigmund Freud is the father of psychiatry. Uh, Dostoevsky, I wrote in my um, book diary, was the most depressed man on earth. Kind of reminds me of when Paul Theroux crossed, came back on the Strait of Siberian Railroad railway uh, from east to west. He was reading Dostoevsky and actually drinking 
too much. And then I think he got depressed because in the book that he wrote uh, depicting this travel, he didn't he didn't have much to say about his return trip to Europe. But I think he was probably pretty tired by this point. The next book is A Complete History of the Negro Leagues by Mark Rabowski, published in 1995. This is a, was a, a tremendous book. <coughs> really something. <coughs> you know, Jackie Robinson was the first African-American baseball player in Major League Baseball in 1946. Uh, actually, the first in a long time. There had been some back in the 1800s. Uh, I know Fleet Walker, but eventually they had been banned from Major League Baseball. They, they, weren't, they were not allowed to play. It was a terrible thing that was done. And it was done really to protect uh, jobs for white players, which, you know. Anyway, so they developed their own leagues, the Negro Leagues, all African-American players. And this is the story of that league. Uh, these uh, tremendous players who never had a chance to play. Most of them didn't have a chance to play Major League Baseball. Rube Foster. Satchel Paige, of course, actually, who did contribute to the 1948 Cleveland Indians uh, World Series Championship. Josh Gibson, who they said was, was as great as Babe Ruth. Sam the Jet Jethro, who played for the 1945 Negro League World Series Champions Cleveland Buckeyes. Yeah, Quincy Troop, who also played on that team. And so I found this interesting, you know, something that I knew very little about. Of, uh, you know, these were, this is baseball in the 20th century, and these fellows. And actually, the sad thing is when uh, African Americans were allowed to play Major League Baseball, the teams didn't allow, uh, there was kind of an unofficial quota of, of two players per team. And that went on for a long time. And then African Americans really stopped supporting the Negro Leagues. So, and the Negro Leagues went out of business. There wasn't enough, they couldn't make money. And so most of the players, ironically, <clears throat> when African Americans were allowed to play Major League Baseball, most of the African American professional players found themselves out of work because they only took the best players. So that was that was kind of a sad thing. But uh, anyway, you know, Jackie Robinson. You think of all the tremendous African American players since then. Hank Aaron, who's the home run king. Well, or at least was. And then Barry Bonds, who actually broke his record. And then uh, Willie Mays. And uh, oh my gosh, so many. Tremendous players. Charlie Spikes, my favorite player in Cleveland. Amazing players. Reggie Jackson, and uh, yeah, so it's really something. The next book is Ermita by F. Shonel Jose, published in 1988. Uh, this is my first book by F Frankie Jose. The F is, fr is Frankie, they call him Frankie, and uh, I read almost, well, uh, um, I'm sure I haven't read his most recent books, but I read quite a few of his books and really enjoyed them. Back then, I was very liberal. In fact, you could say I was a communist sympathizer. And these books really promote the communist movement in the Philippines, the uh, New People's Army, which is the communist army in the Philippines. And uh, that's the, his, he writes very, very well. You know, I'm no longer, I'm really a very much strong anti-communist now. But back then, I thought I was really got into these books. Um, this one, Ermita, is a historical novel from the time from the Second World War to the Mar Ferdinand Marcos dictatorship, and uh, he talks about the putrefaction of society. Um, so he was he was something, and I got to meet him. F. Shone, I'll be talking more about his books, and he he still has a bookstore. I wrote him letters, and we had went and, and we went and had merienda, which was like a snack. So. Even though I don't agree now with his politics, but a very fine writer. These are wonderful novels that he wrote set in the Philippines. Well, we're out of time. As Scarlett O'Hara always said, tomorrow is another day. And as Jar Jar Binks said in episode one, we's a going home. Thanks for watching. Hope you find a good book. See you next time.